This is lecture 4b. Today we're going to talk about equilibrium constants called formation constants, abbreviated K sub f. And this is just the equilibrium constant for the complete formation of a complex ion. An example of a complex ion, diamine silver, whose formula is Ag, NH3 taken twice, positive one charge. This would be created by combining the silver metal with the two ligands to create the complex ion. That reaction would be written like this, Ag plus plus two NH3 yields Ag NH3 taken twice plus. This is a formation reaction because it forms the complex ion from the metal and the ligands. The equilibrium constant expression for this reaction would just be products over reactants and that ratio of the molarity of the products to the reactants equals an equilibrium constant called the formation constant or K sub F. That would be the concentration of the complex ion divided by the concentrations of the metal ion and the ligands multiplied together. Let's give you a chance to do one. Let's see if you can write the reaction for the complete formation of hexaamine cobalt 2 and then write its KF expression. This particular complex ion's formula would be CO, NH3 taken six times and would have a positive two charge. The formation reaction would be the cobalt ion combining with the six ammonia molecules. And when it does, it would form CO, NH3 taken six times, two plus. Equilibrium constant expression would be the concentration of the complex ion divided by the concentration of the cobalt two ion multiplied by the concentration of the ammonia to the sixth power. Now, if we can write a KF expression for a formation reaction, then we can quantitatively do calculations based upon that. If a solution is 0.250 molar in cobalt two ions and 0.100 molar in the hexaamine cobalt two complex at equilibrium, and the formation constant is 1.00 times 10 to the fifth, calculate the concentration of the ammonia in the solution. So we have the formation uh, expression written in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. If we're at equilibrium, we know the value of K sub F, 1.00 times 10 to the fifth. We know the concentration in the numerator of the complex ion, 0.100 molar. And we know the concentration of the cobalt ions in the denominator, 0.250 molar. The only thing we don't know is the ammonia concentration. So if we want to solve for that, I'm going to move the ammonia concentration to the sixth power to the numerator on the left side and bring the K sub F down to the denominator on the right side. So I now saw, have solved my expression for the concentration of ammonia to the sixth power. If I want the concentration of just the ammonia, I will have to take the sixth root of both sides of the equation. So the concentration of ammonia will be the sixth root of the concentration of the complex ion divided by the concentration of the cobalt two ions and multiplied in the denominator by the K sub F. So these numbers are all given. If you can figure out in your calculator how to take the sixth root of an answer, then you'll determine the concentration of the ammonia in this solution at equilibrium, which turns out to be 0.126 molar. Let's look at another example using formation constants. The formation constant for diamine sulfur 1 is 1.00 times 10 to the sixth. Calculate the silver ion concentration in a solution that was originally 0.100 molar silver ions and 0.500 molar ammonia. This is different from the previous problem. The previous problem, they gave us concentrations at equilibrium. This problem, they're giving us concentrations that are not at equilibrium. They say original concentrations. The reaction is going to reach equilibrium, and then we want to know what's going to be the silver ion concentration there. This is the type of problem that requires an ice table. So we know the equilibrium constant for the formation of the diamine silver one. I need to write that reaction out. Silver ion plus two ammonias yields the diamine silver one. And then I'm going to write an ice table for this. The initial molarities are given in the problem. It's 0 0.100 molar silver. 0.500 molar ammonia, and we're assuming that no reactions occurred yet, so you'll have no diamine silver one in the solution initially. The question is going to be what's going to be the equilibrium concentration of the uh, silver ions, and the reason it's not 0.100 is some of it's going to react away, and the amount that reacts away is going to be 1 times x. 
the amount of ammonia that reacts away would be two times X, and you'll form positive one X of the diamine silver one. So the equilibrium molarities are 0 0.100 minus X, 0 0.500 minus two X, and X. Now, if we do this problem, let's think about what the value for X is gonna be. Our equilibrium constant is 1.00 times 10 to the sixth. That's a really big number. That means at equilibrium, you're gonna have mostly products. Way back at the beginning of the semester, we talked about this concept. If you're gonna have mostly products and then at the equilibrium line under your product, which is the diamine silver, it says X. That means X is gonna to have to be a big number. So this reaction is going in the forward direction strongly, has a large equilibrium constant, and therefore X is gonna wind up being a large number. And we found that if you have X as a large number and you try to algebraically solve for it, it's not gonna work. So in a situation like this, what we have to do is we have to make the reaction not be spontaneous in the forward direction. We have to make it spontaneous in the reverse direction. So we have to do a stoichiometric shift. So this is not gonna work. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shift as much of the silver ions and, and ammonia molecule molarities over to the product side so that when we do our ice table, the reactions go into the left instead of the right, and that way X will be a small number. So to do a shift, you have to react away either all of the reactants or at least all of one reactant. And in this case, we can't react them all the way because they're reacting a one to two ratio and their molarities are in a one to five ratio. So you're gonna to have to pick which one you think reacts away and half the time you'll get it right, half the time you'll get it wrong. In this case, I'm gonna get it right. I'm gonna assume silver reacts away completely and it would have to react with 0 0.200 molar ammonia. If you had thought the ammonia was gonna react away completely, you would have written negative 0.500 under the ammonia and then you would have had to have written negative 0.250 under the silver, which winds up giving you a negative number that's impossible. So silver has to be the limiting reactant because when it reacts away completely, it'll react with some of the ammonia. There'll be some ammonia left over. And because silver and the complex ion are in a one-to-one -one ratio, you'll form 0 0.100 molar of the uh, complex ion. So now that's going to give us new initial molarities. There'll be no silver, there'll be 0 0.300 molar ammonia, and there'll be 0 0.100 molar in the diamine silver one. Because there's a zero on the left side, the forward reaction cannot occur. The reverse reaction has to be spontaneous. So the reaction is going to the left. I'm going to form 1x of silver. I'm going to form 2x of ammonia. And I'm going to react away 1x of the diamine silver. Equilibrium, you're going to have these amounts. Hopefully that didn't seem too terrible, but I know it was at the beginning of the semester. Boy, that was a hard concept. And if X is going to be a big number, you have to do a stoichiometric shift, make the reaction go in the opposite direction. And now, because our X value is a reactant, and we know the reaction has a big equilibrium constant, most of the reactants disappear, react away, so X will be a really small number, and now we can solve for X. The equilibrium constant expression is what you would write next. And for a formation reaction for a complex ion, it's just the complex ion divided by the concentrations of the metal and the ligands multiplied together. We know the K sub F, 1.00 times 10 to the sixth. I know my equilibrium molarities of all three reactants and products algebraically. I place them in there. And now we're going to want to try to solve this for X. This is a fairly complex one to solve exactly, but we can approximate it. Because if we know X is small, that means that the negative X in the numerator being subtracted from 0.100 is going to be really, really small. I can ignore it. And the 2X in the denominator that's being added to the 0.300 is going to be really small. I can ignore that as well. So I'm going to solve this instead. 1.00 times 10 to the sixth equals just more simply 0 0.100 divided by X times 0 0.300 squared. This can be solved, and if you do this, you'll get your value for x, and it turns out x is 1.11 times 10 to the minus 6 molar, which stood for, in our equilibrium line, the molarity of the silver ions, which is what the question asked for. Now, let's relate this to something that we've actually done before in this semester. The solubility product constant for zinc hydroxide is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 17th, <clears throat> And the formation constant for tetrahydroxozinc 8 2 is 5.0 times 10 to the 14th. 
I'm going to give you a couple questions. First one is something we've done before. Let's calculate the molar solubility of zinc hydroxide in pure water. How do you get a molar solubility? That comes from a solubility product constant, a KSP. So we're going to use what's given in the problem, the solubility product constant for zinc hydroxide, which is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 17th. And I'm going to do an ice table for the reaction corresponding to that KSP, which is the reaction of the zinc hydroxide dissolving into water into zinc ions and hydroxide ions. In order to calculate the molar solubility, I need to do an ice table because molar solubility means what's the molarity at equilibrium in this solution. So I need to do an ice table to get equilibrium data. We're starting with a solid, so I don't write any data under that. But before any of the zinc hydroxide dissolves, what is there in pure water? There's no zinc ions, there's no hydroxides. So if you're putting solid zinc hydroxide into a beaker and stirring it up, the zinc hydroxide will start to dissolve and you will form on the product side 1x molar of zinc ions and 2x molar of hydroxide ions. Those will be the two molarities at equilibrium. Once you've completed an ice table, we write the equilibrium constant expression for the reaction. And this is a reaction of a salt dissolving in water, so it's equilibrium constants called the KSP. And I know the numerical values, they're x and 2x respectively, and that multiplies out to make uh, 4x cubed. And if I can solve for x, that's going to be my molar solubility, because if you remember secretly under the zinc hydroxide in the change line, what would you write there if it wasn't a solid? You would write minus x. That stands for the molarity of the solid zinc hydroxide that dissolves. So x is going to wind up being the molar solubility. So because x is the molar solubility, and I know my value for the KSP, I can now solve this. The KSP was 4.5 times 10 to the minus 17th. The KSP equals 4x cubed, divide by 4, take the cube root, and x comes out 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6th. And so that's going to be the molar solubility of zinc hydroxide in pure water. We've done that before. That's not so horrible. Let's try part B. Calculate the molar solubility of zinc hydroxide in a solution that's not water. It's 0 0.10 molar sodium hydroxide. We've done this before as well. If you want a molar solubility, once again, you need to use the KSP. I'm going to write the KSP reaction for the salt dissolving in water. I'm going to do an ice table. The only difference is, is your initial molarities. If you were doing this reaction in water, the zinc and hydroxide molarities would be zero and zero. But if it's in a 0 0.10 molar sodium hydroxide solution, which is a soluble salt, it dissociates into 0 0.10 molar sodium ions and 0 0.10 molar hydroxide ions. Well, that means the hydroxide concentration is now a non-zero value. And if you have a zero on the right side, the forward reaction has to be spontaneous. And so we're going to wind up completing an ice table. However, because zinc forms a complex ion with hydroxides, this is not how to do it in this case. If there was no uh, complex ion formed, we would complete the ice table here. We would write plus x under the zinc, plus 2x under the hydroxide, and the equilibrium molarities would be x and then 0 0.10 plus 2x. We put them into the KSP expression and solve for that. But if you wind up having a complex ion formed, and in this case, this is not correct because zinc forms a complex ion with hydroxide, there is a second reaction that occurs, and that's the reaction between zinc and hydroxide forming the tetrahydroxozincate 2. Two equilibria are occurring, and if you ever have two equilibria occurring, and that's when you're dissolving your salt, and if it happens to form a complex ion with something in the solution, you have to write both equilibria. So let's see if we can do that. Here's the equilibria for the solid zinc hydroxide dissolving in the water. But we also have an equilibria that we know a constant for. We know the formation constant for tetrahydroxozincate 2. I'm going to write that reaction. It would be zinc ions plus four hydroxide ions yields ZnOH taken four times, two minus. So these are two different equilibria that are going to be occurring in this solution. And if you have two related equilibria occurring in a solution, then the overall equilibrium that's going to be taking place is going to be the sum of these. We're going to have to add these two reactions together. So this is what's new here in this particular chapter. If you're dealing with solubility 
and you want the solubility of a salt in a solution that contains some anions, in this case hydroxides, but if the metal can form a complex ion with those hydroxides, then you've got to write both reactions that you know equilibrium constants for and add them together. In this, the zinc ions will cancel out of the uh, equilibrium reaction that's occurring, and then I can actually cancel out two hydroxides from both the left and the right side, so the hydroxides disappear on the right, and on the left side it reduces down to two hydroxides, so the equilibrium that's occurring here, if we add them together, is ZnOH taken twice solid plus two hydroxide ions is in equilibrium with the tetrahydroxozincate 2 ion. We're going to have to use this bottom equilibrium to do an ice table with, so we need to know its equilibrium constant. The KSP for zinc hydroxide was 4.5 times 10 to the minus 17th. The K sub F for tetrahydroxozincate 2 was 5.0 times 10 to the 14th. So the question is, what is the equilibrium constant for my bottom reaction? And as you may recall, if you add two reactions together to make a third, the equilibrium constant for the third reaction is the product of the equilibrium constants for the two reactions you added. So I'm going to multiply 4.5 times 10 to the minus 17th by 5.0 times 10 to the 14th, and I'm going to get an equilibrium constant for the overall equilibrium reaction of 2.25 times 10 to the minus second. So now we're just going to see if we can do an ice table for this reaction at the very bottom. So what's in the solution? Well, zinc hydroxide is a solid. We'll leave that out. They said the molarity of the hydroxide ions were 0 0.10, and before any reaction occurs, we'll have no product complex ion. The spontaneous reaction has to be in the forward direction, so we're going to react away 2x molar of the hydroxides. We're going to form 1x molar of the tetrahydroxozincate 2. The equilibrium molarities will be 0 0.10 minus 2x and then x. If we write the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction, and it has no special term, you could call it Kc or Keq or just K, products over reactants, it's the tetrahydroxozincate 2 molarity on the top, and the hydroxide molarity squared on the bottom. And if I plug in my value for the equilibrium constant and my equilibrium molarities, I now have an expression I can solve for x. I can ignore the x in the denominator because it's probably going to be small. If the 5% rule applies, I may have to recycle it. But nonetheless, you should be able to solve this for x. And if you do, x comes out 2.3 times 10 to the minus fourth. And in this reaction, what does X stand for? How is it related to the molar solubility? Well, the way you answer that is you go to the solid, which is in the beginning of the reaction, ZnOH taken twice. Go down to its change line. What would you have written in the change line under the zinc hydroxide? You would have written, if it wasn't a solid, minus X. And because that stands for the molarity of the solid that dissolves, in this case, it turns out that X is the molar solubility as well. And so therefore, our final answer is the molar solubility of the zinc hydroxide will be 2.3 times 10 to the minus fourth molar. This is a higher value than its molar solubility in pure water, which is 10 to the minus sixth. So the fact that it forms a complex ion actually allows more of the zinc hydroxide to be soluble. <clears throat> now, I want to talk today for the remainder of the period about properties of coordination complexes, most of these being with transition metals. So some of the things about coordination complexes is they have different numbers of ligands. We've seen some have two ligands, some have four, some have six. Why does a metal bond to a specific number of ligands? We're going to see if we can come up with a theory to try to explain why each particular metal bonds to a unique number of ligands. Second is the shape. We have complex ions that are tetrahedral, octahedral, linear. There are some that are square planar, and there doesn't seem to be at least an electrostatic reason for that. So we're going to see if we can come up with some theoretical explanation for why they may happen to take the particular shape they do. Third, something that we haven't actually seen because uh, we haven't shown any pictures of them yet, but many of them are colored. If you have complex ions with the transition metal cobalt, if you bond the cobalt to different ligands, you're going to actually get complexes that are different colors. If the cobalts are bonded to nitrite ions, you get this pinkish color. If the cobalt's bonded to cyanide ions, you get this orangish color. Cobalt bonded to water, this is actually how cobalt ions exist in water. This is how any 
metal ion that's dissolved in water exists, it actually forms a complex ion. The metal bonds to six water molecules, and that's how it floats around. When you write CO3 plus aqueous, this is what really is occurring. CO, H2O taken six times, three plus aqueous. But it's a light blue color. Cobalt ions that are positive three are light blue in water. And cobalt ions co complexed with uh, carbonate ions actually have a greenish color. So why does the color depend upon the ligand attached to the transition metal? We'll see if we can actually come up with an explanation for that as well. And then finally, these coordination complexes experience the property of magnetism. Some are paramagnetic, some are diamagnetic. So we're gonna see if we can answer why some are diamagnetic, which electronically means they do not have any unpaired electrons, and why some are paramagnetic, which means they have at least one unpaired electron in their structure. And an explanation to try to explain some of the properties of these complex ions was actually proposed in 1929 by Hans Baeth, and he proposed a theory to account for the properties of these coordination complexes. And the theory that he proposed is called crystal field theory. Crystal field theory states that due to an electrostatic field produced by the negative charges of the non-bonding electrons of the ligands, this is what's called its crystal field, the breaking of degeneracies of a metal's d orbitals occurs allowing for the prediction of properties of coordination complexes. That's a lovely statement right there. If you have a metal ion and then you bring ligands around it, the ligands all have lone pairs, right? Because the lone pairs are used to bond to the metal. Those lone pairs are negative. So that means you're surrounding the metal ion in a field of negative charge. And because it's coming around in an organized fashion, it's called a crystal field because it's very systematic. So these negative charges that approach the metal actually affect the energy of the metal's d orbitals. His theory says it breaks the degeneracies of the metal's d orbitals. Let's see exactly what that means. If you remember back to atomic structure, electrons are arranged in atoms in a very systematic way. They're arranged in energy levels, right? And depending upon how close they are to the nucleus, they're in different levels called energy levels. We know that an atom can place electrons in the first energy level, and the first energy level, as was solved for in the Schrodinger equation, exists as only one orbital. The only orbital that exists in the first energy level of an atom is called the 1s orbital. It's the smallest orbital, therefore electrons in it are close to the nucleus, therefore they get attracted very strongly, so their energy is very low. Once that orbital gets filled, if there's any more electrons in an atom, they would have to go into regions of space further from the nucleus, and those regions of space further from the nucleus constitute the second energy level. The second energy level is actually composed of two different sublevels. There's an S sublevel and there's a P sublevel. The S sublevel has a spherical orbital in it. It's called the 2S, looks exactly like the 1S, but it's bigger. And the fact that it's bigger means the electron in it on the average is further from the nucleus, so therefore it's not attracted as much, so its energy is higher, it's less negative. There's also a P sublevel in the second energy level. These P sublevel orbitals are dumbbell shaped, and they always come in groups of three. So there are three additional orbitals in the second energy level, dumbbell shaped, one along the x axis called the 2px one along the y-axis, I'll have the axis pointing towards us as the y, and then one along the z-axis uh, pointing in the up and downward direction. These three p orbitals, 2px, 2py, 2pz, have the same energy, and we have a name for that. Orbitals that have the same energy are called degenerate. That's important. Now, if you wanna put more electrons into an atom, they'll have to go further from the nucleus, and that constitutes the third energy level. And whatever energy level you're in, that's how many sublevels that energy level has. So the first energy level had one sublevel, the S. The second energy level had two sublevels, the S and P. The third energy level has three sublevels, S, P, and D. An S sublevel always comes as one orbital. So we're going to have one round 3S orbital in the third energy level. P sublevels always come in groups of three orbitals. So the P sublevel in the third energy level will again be three orbitals. They'll look the same shape. They're just going to be bigger, but they'll be called the 3px, 3py, 3pz. 
And the final sublevel in the third energy level is a group of orbitals that are uh, consistent in their shape, their four leaf clover shape, but they always come in groups of five and they're called D orbitals. And the way we name them is we name them essentially by what plane they're on. The P orbitals are named by what axis they're on because they're linearly arranged. But the D orbitals are flat orbitals. You have a four leaf clover array in a plane. So the first one is on the XY plane, that's called the 3D XY. The next one is on the XZ plane, so it's called the 3D XZ. And the next one is on the YZ plane, so it's called the 3D YZ. The fourth one is also on the XY plane. I want you to compare the picture of the fourth one to the first one, because this is what's important. The fourth one, the four different lobes of electron probability point right on the X and Y axis. Can you see that? The one on the very left, the lobes are pointing into the quadrants. It's easier to see that with the second orbital, the 3DXZ. You can see those four lobes are pointing into the quadrants. So the first three D orbitals that are named XY, XZ, and YZ have their four leaf shape uh, to them, and the lobes are pointing into the quadrants. The last two orbitals are different in that the lobes are pointing directly on the axes. So if you're pointing directly on the X and Y axis, we call that the 3D X squared minus Y squared. And then we have one final orbital where the lobes are pointing directly on the Z axis. It looks more like a P orbital, but it has this donut around the middle of it. Because it's pointing on the Z axis, it's called the 3D Z squared. These five D orbitals all have the same energy, so therefore they're degenerate. And what we're saying according to the crystal field theory is that when these orbitals experience ligands approaching them, they cause these five orbitals not to have the exact same energy. The degeneracy is broken, their energies change, and we're gonna look how they change. So we're gonna apply crystal field theory for different numbers of ligands and see what we can predict just assuming that this theory is correct. So many complexes have six ligands. If you have six ligands, the six ligands would probably approach along the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, forming a crystal field that's octahedral. And the reason we believe that is when six ligands surround a metal atom, they always arrange octahedrally because that minimizes repulsion. When the ligands are negative, they repel each other. They want to spread out as much as they can. And so the way you spread out six repelling groups as much as possible, according to the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, is octahedrally. So we're going to assume the ligands arrange themselves in an octahedral array. And these ligands are going to have effect on the d orbitals we've just talked about. I've got the dyz, the dxy, the dxz, the dx squared minus y squared, and the dz squared. Okay, now what's going to happen here? If I bring ligands around a metal atom and they're going to be in an octahedral geometry, if you look at the second picture, this is where the ligands would approach. Two would approach along the y axis, two would approach along the x axis, two would approach along the z axis. Those green dots are in an octahedral geometry. So when you have a metal and you have an octahedral crystal field, which means you have ligands approaching it in an octahedral geometry, the ligands will approach the metal atom in this array and it's gonna affect each of these D orbitals and they're gonna be affected a little differently and let's see if we can determine how they are affected differently. So let me bring the six ligands around each and see if we can figure out which ones are gonna cause the greatest amount of repulsion. So on the metal, the d orbitals contain electrons, and we know the ligands contain electrons, they're gonna repel. Which one of these look like they're gonna repel the most? Well, it's probably gonna be the last two. I want you to take a look at those last two orbitals. Look at the very last one specifically. That d z squared orbital has its lobe pointing straight up and down. What's exactly above the d z squared? A ligand. What's directly below the d z squared? A ligand. The red part of that dz squared orbital is pointing directly at those two ligands. That's going to cause massive repulsion. Look at the fourth one, the second from the right. You've got your four lobes of the dx squared minus y squared pointing directly at the two ligands on the x-axis and the two ligands on the y-axis. So we're going to have a lot of repulsion between those. If you look at the first three orbitals, look where their lobes point. Do they point directly at the ligands? No, my first one points out into the quadrants. 
So because it's not pointing directly at the ligand, it's not going to cause as much repulsion. This one's pointing into the quadrants. It's not going to cause as much repulsion. This one's pointing into the quadrants. It's not going to cause as much repulsion. Here's where the repulsion occurs, right at the ligands, right at the ligands. So if you have a metal atom in a crystal field that's an octahedral geometry, you're going to cause the first two d orbitals to be repelled some. Their energies will go up, the first three rather. But the last two d orbitals will be repelled so much more that their energy will go up a lot more than the first three. So the d orbitals pointing at the ligands will be repelled the most. And in terms of energy, their energy will be higher than the energy of the first set of three d orbitals. So we get a splitting of energy. If the crystal field theory is correct, this is what would happen just based upon the repulsion, the massive repulsion between the last two orbitals and the ligands compared to the lesser amount of repulsion between the first three d orbitals and the ligands. So if we want to graph this, if a metal atom does not have any ligands next to it, all five of its d orbitals are the same energy, they're degenerate. But if you put them in an octahedral crystal field, the energy of those d orbitals will all go up because the ligands will repel against them, but they'll split in energy. The dxy, the dxz, the dyz will be a little bit lower in energy, but the highest energy d orbitals, the most unstable ones, the ones that are repelled the most, will be the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared. And there will be some difference in energy between the two sets of d orbitals, and we call that the octahedral splitting energy capital delta is used for splitting energy and the subscript O, that's not zero, but O for octahedral. This is the energy difference between the d orbitals in an octahedral ligand field. So graphically, it would be the difference in energies between these two levels right here. Now, what determines that splitting energy? It has a, to do with a couple of things. The splitting energy is determined both by the metal ion charge and what the ligands are. So both the metal ion charge and the ligands in the complex affect the octahedral splitting energy. We'll talk about that later. Now, what if you have four ligands instead of six? What would happen to the d orbitals energies if you have a um, crystal field in which the four ligands are, let's say, arranged in tetrahedral geometry? Well, let's take a look at our d orbitals one more time. If you're going to bring four ligands around a metal and they're going to be tetrahedrally arranged, let me show you how you can place those pictorially. If you draw a cube around a d orbital, if you put the ligands on two opposite corners of the top face of that cube, then you will get a tetrahedron if you put the other two on the bottom two opposite corners. So take a look at this. On my top face, I have my two ligands arranged across from each other. And then on the bottom face, I have the two ligands on the opposite corners across from each other. These four green ligands actually arrange themselves around the d orbital in a uh, tetrahedral geometry. So kind of a tricky way to draw a tetrahedron. So if you have four ligands in a tetrahedral geometry, this is how they are going to approach the metal atom. And if they approach each of these d orbitals, we can try to figure out how they're going to influence their uh, attraction or, or rather repulsion between the ligands and the d orbitals. So let's take the d orbitals one at a time. If you look at the very first d orbital, where are the lobes pointing? They're pointing right to the edges of that cube. And really, that's where the ligands are. The ligands are up there in the corners. They're right at the ed end of an edge. So this orbital is actually pointing obtusely towards our ligands. That might cause a lot of repulsion. This one is pointing right to the edges, which is where the ligands are. This one is pointing right to the edges of the cube, which is where the ligands are. Now, look at the last two. Where are the lobes pointing here? Are they pointing to the edges? Oh, let, me, let me just state this first then. So the dxy, dxz, and dyz point to the edges of the cube, which is towards the ligands. But if we look at our third orbital, the lobes are pointing right into the middle of the faces. This is not where the ligands are. This is pointing further away from the ligands. This will cause less repulsion. 
If you look at the last orbital, where are those red lobes pointing? Right in the middle of the faces. So the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared point to the faces of the cube, which is further away from the ligands. So in tetrahedral geometry, it turns out the first three orbitals are the ones that repel the most because they actually point closer to the ligands. The last two are the ones that repel the least because they don't point towards the ligands. And so when you put a metal atom in a tetrahedral geometry, the first three orbital energies go up really high and the last two don't go up quite as much. So graphing that, here's the energy of d orbitals when there's no ligand field around them. The d orbital energies are degenerate. But if you put them in a tetrahedral field, the dz squared and dx squared minus y squared orbitals are low in energy, and the dxy, dxz, dyz are higher in energy. The difference in the energies of these split d orbitals is it's splitting energy, and because it's in a tetrahedral field, it's called delta sub t for the tetrahedral uh, splitting energy. And they've actually shown mathematically, just by figuring out repulsion in an octahedral field and a tetrahedral field, that for the same metal ion and the same ligands, the tetrahedral field splitting is always four-ninths the energy of the octahedral field splitting. So this is always a smaller value. Now, if we have four ligands approach a central metal, but this time in a square planar geometry, let's see how these particular ligands affect the energies of the d orbitals. Here I've drawn the five different d orbitals, and I've placed four ligands around the d orbitals in a square planar geometry along the x and y axes. You can see the four green circles, meaning the negative ligands, pointing along the x-axis, along the y-axis, forming that square. Which one of these orbitals is going to be repelled the most by those four ligands? It's got to be the fourth one. The fourth orbital, the dx squared minus y squared, has its four lobes pointing directly at the four different ligands. That means that because the ligands are on the xy axis, they make the dx squared minus y squared the most unstable, and its energy is going to go up more than any other orbital in this picture. The second orbital over, the dxy has its four lobes in the xy plane, although they're pointing off into the quadrants, but they're also very close to the four different ligands. So the dxy will be the next most unstable because it's in the xy plane. The fifth orbital here actually causes some repulsion because of the donut there. So the dz squared will be the next most unstable because of that donut arrangement of electron probability would repel against the four different lobes. And then finally, both the dyz and the dxz will be the most stable because their lobes point out of the xy plane. Look at this, the first orbital there, where are the lobes pointing? Above and below the xy plane, they're pointing towards the z axis. Same one here, it's pointing above and below the plane. So they're not pointing directly at the ligands, they'll have the least amount of repulsion. So when the energy split because of the repulsion, we're gonna have the d x squared minus y squared the most unstable, the dxy second, the dz squared third, and then the final two orbitals will be the least repulsed and they'll have the uh, lowest amount of energy. So graphing the d orbitals in a non-field where their energies would be degenerate, if you put them in a square planar geometry, you're going to wind up splitting them into four different energy levels with the dx squared minus y squared being very unstable and then a really big gap between the remaining orbitals, which are the dxy, dz squared, and dx squared, and d, or dxz and dyz. In this case, the splitting energies for square planar are actually smaller for the lower four orbitals, so they're fairly close together but the splitting energy is very high for the uh, dx squared minus y squared. And then let's look at one more geometry. Let's look at a situation where a complex ion has only two ligands in it. That's where you'd have linear geometry. So let me draw my d orbitals in a linear geometry, and I'll have the two uh, ligands approach on the z axis. And if you do this, the orbital that's going to be the most unstable is the one that's going to be facing those ligands directly, and that's going to be the fifth one, the dz squared. That's the most unstable orbital of all. That's because the ligands are pointing along that z-axis, so they make that dz squared orbital point its electrons right at it, causing the most repulsion. 
Which ones might be the next most unstable? We'll look at anything that's pointing in the Z direction. That would be the first one and the third one. They're not pointing directly on the Z axis, but they're pointing in the Z direction. So the DYZ and the DXZ will be the next most unstable because they point diagonally towards the Z axis. And then these two orbitals right here are pointing only on the XY plane, so they don't point anywhere near the Z axis. So they're gonna be equal in energy and they'll be the most stable. So the D orbitals on the XY plane are the ones furthest from the Z axis will be the most stable. So what happens here is when you put them in a linear crystal field, the DZ squared is the most unstable, then the DYZ and the DXZ, and finally the ones in the XY plane are the most stable. So graphing the energy of the degenerate D orbitals when you place them into a linear field, you wind up splitting the d orbitals into three different energy levels. That would be the dz squared the highest, the dxy and the dyz in the middle, and the dxy and the dx squared minus y squared at the bottom. Now, one thing to point out is that if you only have two ligands approaching a metal, that's only two negative charges affecting the d orbitals. With repulsion of only two ligands, the energies do not increase as much, and so the splitting energies are a little bit smaller. So my five D orbitals I've drawn on the right side of the slide here have not moved up in energy as much as if you would have had four or six ligands. With the repulsion of four or six ligands, the energies of the D orbitals are increased significantly and actually the splitting energies in an octahedral field can actually either be large or small depending on other things. But let me show you what the octahedral splitting looks like here if we have an octahedral field with six ligands, the energies are gonna be way higher than that just because there's more negative charges coming to the metal. So one thing to recognize. So in summary, you can have six ligands that are octahedral, four ligands that are tetrahedral, four ligands that are square planar, or two ligands that are linear. So they create these different types of fields. And I would like you to know how the D orbitals are gonna split in all four of these different uh, crystal fields. So for the octahedral field, you get the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared high in energy, the dxy, dxz, dyz low in energy. For the tetrahedral field, it's exactly flipped. And as we said, mathematically can be shown just from elect electrostatic calculations that the splitting energy of the tetrahedral field, is about half, it's four ninths the, the splitting energy of the octahedral field, assuming same ligands and same metals. So it's smaller gap between them. For a square planar field, we have this one very unstable orbital, the dx squared minus y squared, very high in energy, and then all the other ones below that. And then in a linear field, because there's only two ligands that are repelling, the energies are lower, and they are the dz squared at the top, and the dxy, dx squared minus y squared at the bottom. If these are the arrangements of the d orbitals in terms of energy in the different fields, then we can actually use this to predict the favored number of oligands for a metal ion. And here's how we would do that. <clears throat> if you're a metal ion and you have three d electrons, you would pick or you would actually become a complex ion, which you would allow your three different electrons to be in the lowest energy state possible. And it turns out that the lowest energy state for three electrons would be the octahedral field because the octahedral field has three low energy orbitals and the electrons can unpair, one, one, one. So the octahedral field is favored energetically if you have a metal with a D3 electron arrangement, 3D electrons. So those types of metal ions form octahedral complexes. They bond to six ligands. It's also favored if you have five electrons because you can put five electrons into the five different orbitals and they would all be unpaired. And that would work out if you have a small splitting energy. So we'll talk about that next time. It's also favored if you have six electrons because in the octahedral field, you can put six electrons in the three lower D orbitals. So octahedral fields are favored energetically for atoms that have 
3D electrons, 5D electrons, or 6D electrons. So any metal ion that has these numbers of D electrons, you can almost bet, at least predicting from this theory, that they're going to bond with six ligands and form an octahedral complex. For the tetrahedral complex, the energies are small gap between them. And this is actually favored for metals that have seven D electrons. Because if you put one electron in each of the five orbitals, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth and the seventh would go in the two lower orbitals. You would have two lower orbitals filled, three orbitals above with one electron each. This is actually the most stable arrangement for arranging seven electrons. So if you're a metal ion and you have 70 electrons, you're going to probably only bond to four ligands. And when you do, those ligands will arrange themselves in a tetrahedral shape. Now, look at the square planar field. We have that one really unstable orbital at the top, the dx squared minus y squared. So there's no time where that orbital would ever gain electrons. That's always going to be very unstable. So this would be the arrangement that would be favored by a metal that has eight d electrons because you have four orbitals that could all fill with the eight electrons and you wouldn't have to put any in the dx squared minus y squared. So any metal ion that has eight d electrons, we would expect to bond to four ligands and they would bond in a square planar geometry. Finally, when would you have something only bonding to two ligands? Well, that would be if you have 10 d electrons, maybe nine, but certainly 10, because this allows for all 10 electrons to be as low as energy as possible. The lesser number of ligands causes the energies not to go up as much. And so anytime you have nine or 10 D electrons, your electrons will be the most stable if they only bond to two ligands. And so we would expect these types of atoms or ions to actually form linear complexes with only two ligands.